here are my disclosures. The right side of that's my first time to Vail. Uh, never been here in the winter, so this has been a wonderful time. That, and there on the left was me at Snowbird last year, first time at this meeting, which was uh, the reason I was very excited to get to come back. Um, so prostate cancer markers, I'll try to use, skip some of the things that may have overlap with what Matt's already gone over great, but when I think of it clinically for our group, break them into two categories, just in general, prognostic and predictive. We're very good at prognostic. Uh, you've already seen this whole list of things that are very good at it. Predictive is really the holy grail for markers, and we're just not really there yet, and that's the effect of a therapeutic intervention, not just is this a bad cancer? Um, and we've really gotten there now with targeted therapy that is responsive to specific genetic mutations. So um, the, as this slide's already been shown, I, I do kind of point to the bottom of that. And you can see off to the right, almost none of these are predictive. I would argue that HRR is, is largely predictive because it at least suggests you're gonna respond to PARP inhibitors in late stage disease. And then as has been pointed out, the level of evidence for validation is kind of all over the map for these. Most of them done on retrospective cohorts. Very little of this is done prospectively through clin clinical trials, and I would say the one that's slightly different is Decipher, which has done a good job partnering with clinical trial sponsors so that we can have data that's collected prospectively and then look back at to see did this actually predict uh, the risk group appropriately and also potentially the outcomes with therapy. So in clinical practice, I would kind of modify that and say in community practice, and this is certainly different in academic centers where there may be factors that drive a certain type of process. Um, we have everything available at our fingertips in community practice. I can choose whatever I want, so I don't have any pressure from above. We certainly use all the clinical, potentially some of the genomic. A lot of the genetic has really grown in the last few years, and then imaging with MRI despite all the caveats for issues with inner observer variability. So this slide I've, I've kind of built from several years ago, and it's similar to Matt's slide that shows you, boy, we just didn't have a whole lot a few years ago. This was really when I was at the AUA when Prolaris first launched. Um, it was very exciting at the time. I just finished residency, and that was my clinical focus in my research year was multiplex markers that were genetic and could at least predict what the aggressiveness of disease was going to be. And then here we are just a few years later, and it's blown up, and now it's very difficult to choose your testing partner or even what your pathway is going to be. And I really say that the box that I'm paying the most attention to is now off to the right. There's a lot of things on the left that we can use, but we've gotten very good at trying to tease out PSA and the things that are free or that we get for very cheap to select who we're going to biopsy. But for me, it's really about how are we going to treat you and how aggressively are we going to treat you. So I would say it's so 2010 if we're using markers to try to select for active surveillance. That ship has sailed and we should be doing it. Now that was when I joined my group, I launched a program to say we are going to use these markers to push people to active surveillance because our active surveillance rates were horrible. Um, now years later, it's 50, 60% and above depending on who the, the provider is. So we don't need that test to feel comfortable with active surveillance anymore and low risk. So the future is really the next steps. Do, who do we intensify treatment? Who do we select specific therapies for? And then potentially who can we de-escalate therapy with? So I do like to point out some of the real wins from clinical trials um, because this has kind of tailored our practice um, locally. And, and one is one that's dear to my heart, which started with the music program in Michigan where I was training. Uh, G minor, which was uh, kind of the first prospectively collected genomics trial. And they basically split men into two groups, those who they got the genomic score from Decipher and those that were kind of hidden results from Decipher. And they used Matt's favorite test, which is Capra S, which is a great risk predictor. It's multiplex. A uh, bunch of different inputs, and they looked at the rates of salvage or adjuvant radiotherapy between those two groups. And it was a higher rate of radiotherapy in the, those that received the genomic testing. Uh, the, the risk was higher if you were controlling for CAPRA that men were more likely to proceed with getting adjuvant therapy. Once again, we don't know if that's the correct answer, but it was certainly trying to predict men that were higher risk and those did get more therapy. And so they're continuing to track and follow up to see does that actually mean anything for their disease outcome. Then when you look at disease uh, application within clinical trials, this is another example. This was a, uh, the radonks in the room would probably beat me to death for trying to summarize a radonk trial. But this was a inter intermediate risk, no hormones, which is not necessarily what the, the standard practice is currently. And they basically took tissue from these patients. They did a decipher testing. And with that, they were able to predict uh, the prognosis, uh, prognosis for progression, BCR, METs, and, and downstream uh, progression to death, if they were a low genomic risk, there was very little difference between the two treatment arms in terms of the intensity of radiotherapy. But if they had a high genomic risk, there was a much bigger delta between 
uh, the different types of radiotherapy. And so it suggests maybe for the highest risk men, we need to intensify. We need to give them uh, hormone therapy um, and potentially for a longer period of time than just radiation alone. So this is currently um, you know, proposed at least for as a, a method to choose who you're going to give more hormone therapy to as if they have a higher genomic risk. Uh, in metastatic disease, this is a little bit different. Uh, they've not really used any of the genomic testing in men who are metastatic. We have other markers to kind of track how they're uh, doing with therapy. But this was a retrospective analysis of the STAMPEDE trial, which includes a lot of really high uh, risk and metastatic men. Uh, the genomic score was able to predict both MFS and OS. So if you have a genomic test, it can be run on tissue, and it could say this person is actually low risk for metastasis or survival issues, could you de-escalate therapy after they've responded for a period of time? Um, that's certainly a lot of interest from a financial toxicity standpoint is who can we pick out who's done well with therapy and who can we, we can get rid of the expensive drugs. And then lastly, uh, the, kind of the only prognostic marker we really have for prostate cancer is, is HR mutations. And these combination therapies is going to be the next thing that in the next few years, whatever iteration of this program is ongoing in a few years, we will be here talking about who are we selecting for combination therapy whether it's in CRPC state or whether it's in the hormone responsive state. All of these trials are reporting out, so ASCO GU is going to be very popular for the next few years for combination therapy, and we need a lot of guidance on, is this an all-comers population? Is it specific mutations only? Is it just HRR in a broad net? And we need better kind of guidance on which of those patients are going to receive the best benefit. And I will point out at the bottom, uh, many clinical groups were part of the PROCLAIM registry, which is uh, looked at testing for uh, genetic markers that were germline in men who fit NCCN criteria and then all comers. And there was no difference in mutation rate between those two groups, suggesting that if we're really limited to what the NCCN says you should test these men, you are likely to miss men that don't fit those criteria. So um, we need to keep that in mind that, you know, as you said, NCCN is not always the best metric for us to use going forward. We need to be a little more thoughtful. So I'll kind of conclude with what is the UA way, that's urology associates. We use ancillary testing and MRI, selecting for rebiopsy. Um, it's not a reflex, and that's actually one of the things I think the NCCN gets right, is reflex is a four-letter word. Um, you shouldn't order something without thought going into it. Pretest probability really means probably more than what the test gives you on the back end. Just as he complained about the reports, I think the reports dumb it down for us and the patient, but that's not really what the, the information is being given to the patient. It's just moving that pretest probability one way or the other. Um, germline testing for high risk or family history. We add somatic testing later if they progress. If you're metastatic up front, which is unfortunately a really growing population, we use somatic testing up front, usually on the needle or potentially on their prostatectomy if they have a high-risk disease and they actually move forward with surgery. We prefer archive tissue, it's just much easier. Liquid potentially if they don't have archive tissue within the last 10 years. And then lastly, fresh metastatic biopsies. That's just obviously a step that has not really happened in prostate cancer, even if you sit on multidisciplinary tumor boards. That was the answer for everything else. Oh, it's a lung thing, get, get a biopsy of that, we're gonna send it for testing. That's just never been the answer in prostate for all kinds of reasons related to bone biopsies and, and things like that. And then really nobody knows what the longitudinal testing market is going to be like. Do you repeat testing? Do you use liquid biopsies down the road after progressing on therapy when you may kind of push a cancer to mutate in a different way? Obviously it gets expensive, um, but the therapies are expensive too. So it doesn't make sense to necessarily just start throwing expensive drugs at patients without having some guidance on maybe what your next choice would be. So with that, I will uh, finish up and I'll sit up here on the panel if there are any questions and hopefully I've come in under my time so I won't get yelled at.